Take your Bibles this morning and turn with me in the Old Testament to the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth. <clears throat> As you know, we've been looking at basically a, a subject matter over the last several weeks of relationship, not religion. Our God is looking for a relationship from us, not just religious behavior. There are so many people today that think if you are religious and follow a religious way that that's okay. But in reality, God desires a relationship with us. He wants to have a, a, a working, you know, walking, living, breathing relationship with us, his children. And that's why he sent Jesus to this earth to die on the cross, to pay the price for our sins, to bridge that gap because sin is something that separates us from God. It keeps us away from that presence of God. And so because Jesus has died for our sins and paid the price for our sins, uh, we can come freely and boldly into his presence. And that's what God wants. You know, and what parent wouldn't want that? You know, as parents, we, we want to spend time with our children for the most part, right? Okay, maybe some of them, but anyway. For the most part, we want to spend time with our children. And that's the way God is. He desires to, to spend time with us. And so we've been looking at different aspects of a good, healthy relationship over the last several weeks. And today, we want to look at the subject matter of commitment. Obviously, if you're going to have a healthy relationship, you have to have two people that are committed to each other. Amen. You have to be committed in a committed relationship. And it's, it's kind of sad that we don't see that today. You know, as, as soon as something wrong happens, as soon as something bad happens or things go the way you don't think they should, so many people just, they go their separate ways. You know, and it just, it's sad to see that in, in the world. But it's also true with our relationship with God. Because, you know, life can be hard. We all know that. And things can happen. And so many times when life turns up the heat, people have a tendency to get away from God, to drift away from God. And we lack, they lack that commitment to God and their relationship with God. And so we need to have that type of commitment with God. And as we've been trying to do with all of these uh, subject matters, I try to show it from both points of view. You know, showing that God is committed to us and then how we can be committed to him, how we should be committed to him, okay? And so last week we were talking about how, you know, the, the, you know, the wedding vows pay, play a big part in this subject matter. And, and part of most traditional wedding vows is the part that says, for better, for worse, in sickness and in health, you know, till death do us part, that kind of a thing. That's the part of the wedding ceremony that commitment is all about. And it's the idea for better and for worse, in sickness and in health, for richer for, and for poorer, okay? And, and that's what we need to get in our minds, you know? Uh, things aren't, for the most part, life's pretty easy, you know, day to day, for the most part. It, it's, it's when things are not, when things happen that we don't like, you know, when stress is there, that's when our commitment to God is, is, is challenged, okay? And that's when Satan tries to rear his ugly head and to push us farther away from God. And so we need to battle against that. We truly do. And so when I was thinking about the subject of commitment, okay, this story in the book of Ruth is what came to my mind. Okay, just kind of, and actually, um, Warren Wiersbe, he has a, a commentary on the whole Bible. And actually what he has, he wrote a book on, on each book of the Bible. And the, the title for the book of Ruth is Be Committed. That's what he called uh, th that book. His Bible study on the book of Ruth is called Be Committed. Because Ruth gives us a very beautiful picture of what commitment looks like. And not only what it looks like, but if you know, and we're not going to study the whole book of Ruth this morning. But if you know the end of the story, you know that it, it turned out very well for her. Okay, and we'll get to that here in just a little bit. And so that's why we're here in the book of Ruth today. And then also towards the end, we're going to look at a subject matter in, in, that's kind of one of my favorite portions of Scripture in the, Old, in the New Testament as well. So, But commitment. God is committed to us, whether we believe that or not. You know, and, and again, when things is okay, when life is easy, it's easy to believe that God is committed to us. But we need to understand is that no matter where we are in our life, no matter where you are in your walk and in your journey with life, in life, God is 100% committed to you. It, you know, if you're in the center of, of God's will for your life, he is 100% committed to you. But if you are outside the will of God, living a life of sin and running away from him as fast as you can, I want you to know something today. He's still 100% committed to you. He never quits. He never gives up. Up on the wall, you can see three verses. And actually, it's a progression of a promise that God made. The first verse is in Genesis chapter 28. And I just paraphrased them up there, but I'll read the full verses here to you. But in Genesis chapter 28, God made a promise to Jacob. 
You know that Jacob was going to be that father of the nation of Israel. From him would come the 12 tribes of Israel. And God made a promise to Jacob. He says, behold, I am with thee. And, and, and <laughs> we like to think of Jacob as a good guy. And he really wasn't, okay? If you know what Jacob's name means, Bible names actually have a lot of significance. And the meaning of Jacob, his name, I'm sorry, son, uh, but the name Jacob means supplanter. He, he, was, he was a scoundrel, Jacob was. If you know your Bible at all, he was not really a great, good guy. He really wasn't. He tricked his brother. He stole his brother's birthright. And, and, and then beyond, it just, that's Jacob. But this is the promise God made to this young man. He says, I am with thee and will keep thee in all the places whither thou goest. And I will bring thee again into this land. He says, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. God made a promise to him. And, and, and so I point out the fact about Jacob because a lot of times we feel like, well, God will be with me and he'll be for me and he'll help me as long as I'm living right. It's easier for God at that time, but God is with us no matter where we are in our life, okay? And Jacob, he had to get himself settled and get himself right. And, and God did that. God did that work in him. Then later in the book of Joshua, God repeated that same promise to Joshua as Joshua was preparing to enter back into the promised land with the people. And in Joshua chapter one, verse five, God reiterates his promise to him. And he says, there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. And he says, as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. And again, he says, I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. And that's one of my favorite phrases in the Bible. God has promised, he says, I will never fail thee nor forsake thee. That's who our God is. He, my friends, is 100% committed to us. Now, Joshua, Joshua was a good guy. He was living for the Lord and doing what was right. And God blessed him in a big way. And so again, I want us to understand between these two verses is that God's commitment to us is not based upon us. It's based upon him. His promise. That's who God is. Our God is a faithful God, and He is faithfully committed to us through thick and thin, no matter where we go in life. That's who our God is. That's the type of God that He is. Now, if you sit there and some people are like, well, those are Old Testament promises. Well, the Apostle Paul brought it into the New Testament to you and I as well. In Hebrews chapter 13, Paul said this, he says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he had said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. And so there you have it. Paul extended that promise of God to you and I. And understand is that when Paul wrote that book in, in the Hebrews, he was writing to Gentile people. Somebody asked me the other day, what are Gentiles? Anybody who's not a Jew, okay? And so no matter what other nationality you are, you're probably a Gentile, not a Jew. As I was eating bacon yesterday from, morning, from, from my morning breakfast, I'm like, I'm thankful I'm not a Jew. <laughs> they weren't supposed to eat bacon, so, but anyway. And so that promise is there for you and for I as well. It is a New Testament promise to Gentile believers. God has promised, I'll never leave thee, I'll never forsake thee. God, my friends, is 100% committed to us. There never needs to be any doubt or question. Now, human nature, is we do question that. You know, when things happen, when, when something happens out of the, you know, beyond what we expected, okay, something extraordinary or whatever happens in our life, <coughs> excuse me, something catastrophic, we feel like, oh, has God left me? Has he forsaken me? And it's just the exact opposite. At those hard times in our life, God is closer to us, trying to draw us into his presence with him, trying to teach us. Those are usually very teachable moments in our life where God is trying to teach us something. I've shared this with you many times, you know, because of my life, the way that I was raised, coming from a broken home and, and alcoholism and all the things that was involved in my life growing up and stuff, I truly did not believe that God knew me, that he cared anything about me. I truly felt that way, I really did. But it wasn't until after I got saved and trusted in Christ as my savior that I began to realize is that God, he really has always been there for me in my life. As I look back over the course of my life, I can, at this point in my life, I can look back and see that God was there and I could see what God was doing, the hand of God in my life. And it just, it, to me, it amazes me. It never ceases to amaze me. And so I use that going forward. You know, when things aren't going right and you feel like, God, have you forsaken me? I can look back and I'm like, okay, he's always been there. 
He's always going to be there. He's hiding somewhere, you know, to, 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 to jump out at the last moment. Kind of like Margie came to the store yesterday. I'm like, hi, Marge. And she about jumped off the ground. It's hot. Well, not that bad. But anyway, but sometimes that's what God does. You just never know where he's going to be. And he's going to show himself very powerful in your life. There's a lot of ways that God will do that. Amen. There's a lot of ways that God shows himself. Usually it's through people. God sends people into our lives to, at a time when we need them the most. Someone that's there to just to be a help or a hope or encouragement to offer up a word or whatever. And sometimes you can be that person for someone else. You never realize, you know, if, if God lays someone on your heart, uh, then you need to pray for that person. You truly do. You know, many, I'm not, I don't know about you all, but I'm not one that actually remembers his dreams and stuff like that. But I've gotten to the point where if, if I wake up and I have a dream and, and one of y'all was in that dream, I pray for you and stuff. I figured like God must have put you on my mind for some reason. And I have, I've discovered, and, and maybe you have as well, that later, you know, like that day or that week, I'll see that person and be like, you know, I was going through a tough time. It's like, hmm, that's the day the Lord put you on my heart and mind. I prayed for you. You know, and sometimes I'll tell them, sometimes I won't. It doesn't matter. The point I'm trying to make is, listen, if you all think of somebody, your pastor or family member or just somebody, whatever, pray for that person. Maybe you can give them a call and say, hey, what's up? You know, can I help? Is there something you need? Be involved in people's life because just like we need people in our life to help us through the hard times, to, to show the promise of God in our life, we need that. People need that as well. And so we all need to be a part of this, this community that God has given to us that we can be a big part of it. And so understand today, my friends, this is a promise from God and God does not break his promises. He doesn't. He'll always be there. And so this promise, and I wanted you to see that, goes from Genesis all the way through to the New Testament church today. God has promised, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I will never fail thee nor forsake thee. It is a promise from God, something you can count on. And again, we're sitting in church. It's like, this is great. But you know, as we go out these doors and, and things happen, I want you to remember this promise from God. The next time life turns up the heat, remember God is there in some way, shape or form. Don't lose faith. Don't lose hope. Don't give up on God. Don't turn back. Don't quit. Don't do any of those things. The best thing to do is just stay the course and God will show his hand. Very powerful, very evident in your life. Okay, I've seen it play out in my own life. I've seen it play out in the lives of other people. And yet also I have seen those who have quit on God. Those who have turned their back when they gave up, they lost hope, they lost faith. And so I want to encourage us today. My first point is to understand is that from God's point of view, he is 100% committed to you 100% of the time. And it's not based upon you. There are many times that we go through our life where we feel <laughs> sinful, amen? Where we feel unworthy of his love. We truly do. There are times in our life that it's like that. And it's times like that that God, I think, just embraces us. He truly does. He says, listen, I got you. I love you. We're going to get through this. We truly are. We're going to get through this today. And so that's God's perspective. That's God's point of view. He is always 100% committed to us. Let's go ahead and read our story now here in Ruth, okay? Ruth chapter 1. <clears throat> Jump down to verse 6. We're just going to read a few verses here. As you know, calamity had struck Ruth. She lost her husband, her sons, and all she had left was her daughter-in-laws, and she was in a strange land. And so she determined to go back to Israel, back to her homeland, and she was told her daughter-in-laws to stay here amongst their own people, to leave her and let her go. And so in verse 6, she says, She arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Wherefore, she sent forth out of the place where she was and her two, and her two daughter-in-laws with her. And they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. Judah. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. And the Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. And then she kissed them and they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have an husband. And if I should say I have hope, if I should have an husband also tonight and should also bear sons, would you tarry for me till they were grown? 
Would you stay for them from the having stay for them uh, from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And they lifted up their voice and wept, and, and Orpah kissed her mother in law, but Ruth, now watch this, Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister in law has gone back unto her people. And under her gods, return thou after thy sister-in-law. And verse 16 is our key verse. Ruth said, entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people and thy God, my God. And where thou diest, will I die and where, thou, and where there, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me and more so also, if aught but death part thee and me. And when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. And so there we see the heart of Ruth, this Moabite woman that was determined to stay with Ruth. She had seen something in Ruth, a faith in Ruth, the God of Ruth, Yahweh. And she's like, I want that. I'm going to stay. That's that commitment. Ruth had released, excuse me, Naomi had released her from any kind of commitment. Go back. I don't have any more sons to give you to be, to be your husbands. You go back to your land, to your mothers, to your houses. You're free of any kind of indebtedness you have to me. But Ruth claimed to her. That's the kind of commitment that we need to have. Understand the dire situation that these ladies were in. Okay. They had no husbands, no men to work. And you know, nowadays we don't, that's not such a big deal. But in that day, it was a big deal, okay? The women's, they didn't really work in that day. The husbands went out and did the working and the women stayed home and did the cooking and the cleaning, okay? Some people might think that's archaic or whatever, but that's just how it was. That was the way the culture was of that day, okay? And so they had nothing, no source of income, no place to live, no family, nothing. And Ruth could have very easily have said, you know what, this is too hard. I'm gonna go back to my mom, to her house, back to where she's at, where I can live in ease and comfort and find me a new husband among the Moabite men and, and be okay with that. But she made that determination that no, this is the place I need to be. And so she clave to Naomi and she says, entreat me not to leave thee. That's the kind of commitment that you and I need to have. You know, I've never tried to sugarcoat our relationship with God. You know, a lot of preachers will stand up and say, oh yeah, you get saved to live for the Lord and everything's gonna be great. I know life is not like that, okay? You know, and, 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 and to me, I, I, I see people all the time. There's families I know, and sometimes they go through some things that just like, and I pray, it's like, Lord, why is this family going through it, you know? Why do they have so many troubles one after another, you know? And, and, and it happens. And then there are others that the life is a little bit easier. But whatever, no matter what our circumstances, no matter what our situation may be, we need to have the kind of determination that Ruth had to say that, no, this is where I need to be, to have that kind of commitment even knowing that going forth, it's going to be a hard road. The Bible says, yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall, do you know your Bible? They shall what? They shall suffer persecution. That's a promise from God. You know, and people are like, okay, why do I want to live godly if I'm going to suffer? Because there is reward into it. As I said, if you know your Bible at all, you know the end of Ruth's story, don't you? She met a handsome fella. What was his name? Boaz. <laughs> Boaz. <laughs> He's so dreamy. <laughs> she met a handsome feller. And he became her husband. And we find out later that their child is in the lineage of who? Jesus Christ, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. And so her story doesn't end in that terrible situation of losing her husband and, and her brother-in-law and her father-in-law and all those situations. God redeemed that wonderful woman because she chose to follow God, because she chose to cleave to Jehovah God, to Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. She chose to do that. She had that kind of commitment, even though there was an easier way out, even though society and even Naomi herself said, go. She says, no, I'll not leave thee. I'll not forsake thee. Do we have that kind of commitment today? 
So many people do not. And it's sad to see that. But I want us to understand is that when we do have that commitment, when we make that commitment to God, when we, um, when we are committed to him, like, like it says there, my friends, God will take care of us. In Psalm chapter 37, that's a beautiful psalm. You know, if you're not doing anything today, I encourage you to read Psalm 37. If you haven't had your devotions yet, just read Psalm 37. It is a beautiful psalm. And I'm just going to focus on verse 5 here, though, being committed to God. In Psalm 37, verse 5, the Bible says, Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. God will work everything out, all the hard stuff in our life. He'll work it out. Romans 8, 28 says God will bring all things, he'll work all things together for the good to those that love him, to those that are the called according to his purpose. But only, only when we commit our way to him, trusting in him. That word commit is an interesting Hebrew word. It's the idea of rolling all of our cares upon the Lord. That's what committing to God means, to, to just roll them all upon God, to just hand them over to him. It's a very interesting word. It's hard to, to define. It really is. But th that word to commit means that we're just going to turn it all over to the Lord. In my mind, this is how I think of it, whether I'm right or not, I don't know. But for me, the way I think of this word about committing ourselves to God is I'm going to roll with Jesus wherever I go. <laughs> that's how I look at it. Let's roll together, Jesus. Okay, But that's the idea behind this. Wherever he goes, I'm going to go. Wherever he takes me, I'm, I'm happy to go along on the journey. He's the pilot. I'm not, I'm not even the co-pilot. You see them bumper stickers say that Jesus is in my pilot. I'm, the, I'm not even the co-pilot. I'm sitting in the back with the kids watching TV on the little screen. That's what I'm... Jesus has got this. I'm just going to roll with him. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him in all things that you do. And God's going to get you where you need to go. Plain and simple. That's the idea of us being committed to him. To, to, to lose that control. And that's really the key, isn't it? To commit ourselves to the Lord is to give up that control. To roll it over to the Lord. It's not easy. It's like husband and wife sitting at home and there's only one remote to the TV. <laughs> it's like, who gets to control? You know, who changes the channel and stuff? It's not easy to relinquish control. And, you know, it doesn't matter whoever's driving. The other one, well, shouldn't we go that way? We should have turned there, you know? We always want that control issue. That's how we are. It's human nature. That's the way that we do things. But the idea of committing ourselves to the Lord is entrusting God with that control, allowing him to be the one that, that states where we go and what we do. Sometimes it's scary. Sometimes it's hard. A lot of times we have no idea what's going to happen, but we need to learn to trust him. And I've learned long enough to know that God usually does the right thing. Not usually, he always does the right thing, as long as I just go along with him. But we truly need to be committed 100% to him, just like Ruth, okay? She was committed. We see the end of her story, how that God blessed in a very huge, huge way. And in yourself as well. Think back in your own life, the times that you committed yourself to the Lord and see how God has brought you through. Okay, And so when the next thing comes, just continue to trust the Lord and see how God will bring you through. That's what this life's journey is all about. Many times, and I like to play a little bit of devil's advocate myself, but <clears throat> I ask myself the question, is there something that could happen in my life that would cause me to quit on God? And hopefully all of us would say nothing, you know? There's a story, this, one of the stories I want to talk to you about here is in John chapter 6. Jesus begins to preach and begins his earthly ministry. And when he was healing and baptizing and all these, and he's feeding the 5,000 and doing all these things, everybody wants to follow him. But in John chapter 6, Jesus gets up and preaches a particularly hard message. You know, people like it when the preacher preaches a nice message. God is love. He loves you. Blah, blah. We like that. But when God, you know, when a preacher gets up and preaches about repentance and commitment and all this stuff, we're like, eh, I don't know if I like that so much. And so in John chapter 6, Jesus gets up. Many people are there listening to him preach. And he gets up and preaches. And he preaches a particularly hard message. He's preaching about repentance. And he, basically it's the part of the story where he says that he, that he is the body and, and, and you must eat, partake of his flesh. That's the idea of repentance. And then his blood, drink of his blood. And that's the faith part, accepting the Lord Jesus Christ. But it says then in John chapter 6 that many people, when they heard this, they said, this is too hard. We don't like this message. And it says many people left off from following Jesus. Could you imagine Jesus standing there and he's preaching this message and all these people start walking out. 
As a pastor, that'd be terrible. You know, if you're sitting there and you watch all the people leave and stuff, like, ah, where's everybody going? But they all did. They all left. And so then Jesus turns to his 12 disciples who were there. And that's the verse that we have. That's the, excuse me, the next verse that I have up on the, on the wall there. John chapter 6, verse 67. Jesus says to his 12, he looks at his 12 disciples and he says, will you also go away after this hard message? And that's why I call this the tipping point. I would hope and pray that none of us would have a tipping point. That no matter what life throws at us, we are going to be 100% committed to God, just like he is 100% committed to us. I would hope and pray that we don't have that tipping point. And I think it's important for us to think about this. Most people don't want to think about this, but I, it's something I do. You know, it's like, you know, if this happened, you know, how would I deal with that? If this happened, what would I do? That kind of a thing. You know, playing the devil's advocate, that sort of a thing. Some people might think that's morbid, but I, I, don't, I don't want to fail God. I don't want to quit. I don't want to give up on him. I want to make sure that, you know, it, it's why I have insurance on my house. It's why I have insurance on my car. I want to be prepared in case something happens in life, Okay. And so that, that's the kind of thing that we're talking about here. But that tipping point, spiritually, examine, do that spiritual insurance, if you will. Ask yourself this question, just like Jesus asked the 12 disciples, will you also go away? My friends, there should be nothing in your life. If you're sitting here right now thinking, well, if this happened, yeah, I think I might quit on God. Then you need to work on that, okay? It's something you need to take care of. Talk to your pastor about it. Pray about it. Go to the scriptures about it because there should be nothing. When I ask you the question, if there's something that'll make you quit on God, the answer should be beep, blank. There should be nothing there. That's what commitment looks like. That's the true commitment. Many of the disciples left at that time, but the 12 apostles, Jesus turned to them and he says, will you also go away? And Peter had the right answer. Peter was always the one that spoke up. You know, he was the spokesperson for the group. And he, Peter stood up and I love his answer. He says to Jesus, to whom shall we go? You have the words of life. And that's the key is the words of life, the word of God that God has given to us. My friends, this book, and I know you probably get tired of hearing me preaching about it, but this book is the one thing that will fix everything in your life. When life turns up the heat, you need to get in the book. When you have a decision to make, get in the book. When you don't understand something, get in the book. Okay, read it, study it, learn, grow, know of him. And I've said many times before, you know, we have so many resources available to us. If you're a technological person, there's a wonderful Bible, there's a wonderful Bible program online, which is called BibleHub.com. And it has an immense amount of resources where you can study the word of God. You can have like six versions of the Bible, depending on how big your screen is, okay? Right there, light out one by one, right next to each other and study the word of God that way. There's dictionaries and lexicons and, and, and concordances and so many, all free. Doesn't cost you a dime. And you can study out any, you can type in a word and it'll give you a word study. It's a wonderful resource, you know? And, and if you're not a technological person, then just get in the book and read books. You know, go to the bookstore, go to christianbook.com or whatever and read books, understand the truths of God's word. When life is difficult, the best thing for us to do is to get into the word. That's what Peter says. To whom shall we go? My friends, there is only one God, amen? The creator God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They call him Yahweh, they call him Jehovah. That's who he is. He's the one that has created this world. And when all is said and done, he's gonna come to gather us all together again. We're going to be with him. That's who our God is. Don't quit on him. There is nowhere else to go. There are no other answers. And so I would hope and pray that there's not a tipping point in each and every one of our lives. I would hope and pray that. And then, like I said, lastly, my last point, <clears throat> this is the part of the, the, the wedding ceremony where we say for better or for worse, for better or for worse. That's what it's all about. Understanding that going in, okay? I have never promised people How's that old song? I never promised you a rose garden. And now how that old song went and stuff. It, 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 God has blessed. Don't get me wrong. As I stand here today, I, I, I feel blessed. I truly do. I've said that on more than one occasions, okay? But we all have our difficulties in life. We truly do. We all have hardships and heartaches and pains that we go through. That's what this Christian walk, that's what this Christian life is all about. And if you sit and think, it's like, well, Jesus didn't have, huh? Jesus didn't have to go through any hard times. I think he did. What about y'all, but I think, I think he did. 
Remember when he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane that night? And he says, Father, if there's any other way. But he says, nevertheless, as thy will. And Jesus willingly went to the cross to pay the price for our sins, to bear that burden for us. So he knows, he understands the for worse part. And where is Jesus today, though? He didn't stay on the cross, did he? Amen? He didn't stay on that cross. He ain't in the tomb either. They put him in the tomb and they rolled a stone there and they set Roman guards in front of it. Is he in the tomb? No, he's not in the tomb. God's rolled that stone away. Jesus came out. I can just picture Jesus coming out, <coughs> crack his neck, <coughs> crack his knuckles. <laughs> Maybe he did, but in my mind he did. <laughs> he's like, boom, I did it. <laughs> That's who my Jesus is. And he went back and he walked into town and he showed himself alive. He showed himself alive. And then that day on, on the Mount of Olives, when he was talking to him, he went up. The Bible says he went up to the clouds. And where is he today? He's seated at the right hand of God the Father. And he's waiting. He's waiting for God to reach over and say, Son, go get my children. We're looking forward to that day, the rapture of the church. We're looking forward to that day when we hear the trump of God and the voice of the archangel saying, Come up hither. We all go up to meet the Lord. I don't even, I'm, I wish I knew when that day was so I could have my cape on, ready to fly, right? But I'm not going to have time. It's just going to be time to go. Amen. We look forward to that. That's the better part, for better or worse. The Bible says, Peter says in 1 Peter 4, 19, Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. We need to commit our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, for there is truly no other way. There really isn't.